It's been 14 days of horror for the over 2 million residents of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli offensive, the all-out uh, siege against the Gaza Strip continues. Uh, and we've been reporting consistently on how things have gotten from bad to worse in terms of the humanitarian situation that uh, the, the, all of the residents of the Gaza Strip are facing. Uh, of course, the pressure is now also building up on the West Bank. Uh, but at the same time, solidarity is picking up uh, protests in support of Palestine, uh, in support of humanitarian aid being allowed to reach uh, the Gazan people is gaining momentum, particularly in West Asia and other parts of Asia as well. Here in India, we saw protests. Uh, there have been protests in parts of Southeast Asia as well. Uh, Anna Abrachar will join us today. Uh, to understand what's happening in terms of aid coming in, uh, the possibility of humanitarian aid reaching the people, and how the protests also sink in uh, with, with what, what is going on and the lack of complete action uh, on the part of the international community. Uh, we reported yesterday on how Western leaders continue to come to Israel and continue to voice their support of Israel's right to defend itself. Uh, meanwhile, Palestine, uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip, sorry, has been turned from the world's largest open air prison into <clears throat> a death trap. Uh, that's our lead story, as it has been since the uh, 7th of October on Daily TV. But we're also covering a protest in Italy. Uh, we ask Anna uh, why Italians want access to free public healthcare and why they are against privatization of many of these services. Uh, Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, brought to you by People's Dispatch. Before we go any further, Please take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. United Nations agencies, including those working on the ground in Palestine, including in Gaza, uh, have said that this is, in fact, collective punishment, which amounts uh, to a war crime, as far as that is concerned, and whoever it might matter to, uh, in the context of, of course, international law. Uh, it's very different how things play out on the ground. Uh, and to give us an update on that, we have uh, Anna Bracha uh, joining us today. Uh, Anna, I want to start with protests that are picking up, gaining momentum, solidarity. Uh, for the people of Gaza, uh, as well as, uh, of course, the people of the West Bank and, and uh, uh, the occupied West Bank, uh, because they are also facing the, the fallout or the ramifications of this onslaught. Uh, what's the latest on protests around uh, Asia, as well as other parts, including Europe? Uh, well, mm, all the day today, and essentially, uh, has been building up on what we have seen over the last couple of days, and that's essentially people showing up in massive numbers to support the people, people uh, of Gaza and of Palestine as a whole, uh, in order to uh, call for uh, call for peace, call for uh, a stop to the violence, and uh, just uh, in order to support the Palestinian struggle. So uh, today we've seen protests ranging from, um, and over the last couple of days, as I said, they've been mounting up uh, from Malaysia to India but very strongly building up in the region itself uh, with, of course, the, the protests in Jordan uh, uh, also uh, building up uh, in Egypt, building up in Yemen and building up in, uh, in nearby countries. So uh, essentially the region seems, uh, and these, the people of the region uh, are converging to, to the point uh, to ask, for, for justice for Palestine and for a stop to the um, to the mounting number of deaths that we've seen uh, since the attacks began on October 7th. Uh, to the large extent to which uh, the United States Anna, and its allies are standing in the way of some of these conversations uh, proceeding and aid actually getting to people and an end to this uh, endless uh, horror that we're watching, uh, those of us who are fortunate enough to not be there at present. But but um, you must also be getting reports from hospitals, from aid workers uh, on the ground, talking about the kind of impact this has had and and, and uh, still nothing uh, moving in on that front either. We heard about the 20 trucks or so uh, of aid 
I mean, uh, what do you do uh, more than joke about things like that? Um, so I'm not sure what to do except you know for for finding very bad, bad uh, very sense uh, a very bad sense of humor. But uh, it's essentially uh, something that has been brought up in the protest today as well. Uh, a large part of the protesters in Egypt have headed to the uh, to the border with Palestine in order to demand to uh, 48 to actually get going. Uh, what we've seen today is that UN officials have said, well, the aid might or should get going in the next day or so. At the same time, officials from uh, UN agencies have called those 20 trucks like a drop in the ocean of the needs that uh, that uh, the people of Gaza are seeing. And let's just, you know, go back to what we've been saying essentially, essentially all along. Uh, is that um, there is a dire need in Gaza right now for everything from food to uh, to clean water to um, sanitation uh, sa uh, to sanitation and also uh, when it comes to medicines and when it comes to fuels uh, when it comes to fuel. So uh, hospitals in Gaza have uh, slowly stopped operating because they have run out of fuel, which means that they cannot operate their, their generators, which means that uh, a large part of people are now left without, without essential medical need. Uh, and that's something that um, the West seems, it doesn't seem, but it, do, it does downplay the need of, uh, of the essential supplies to go into Gaza as soon as possible. Um, what's also been reported is that um, the roads, of course, that would lead into Gaza have been bombed and now need to be repaired in order for the aid to get in. Uh, and then finally, of course, you know, you have the um, UN officials again saying that and recognizing in that way uh, that Israel has announced uh, certain limitations to the distribution of such aid uh, in order for it uh, allegedly not to get to Hamas. Uh, but essentially what it will lead to that the, the very limited aid that they're planning to get in and then they say build up over, over, the, next time, over the next days, uh, it's that it's going to get very slowly to the people who really need it and uh, who have experienced attacks on civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, including churches over the last days. A quick reminder, of course, that even before uh, this series of events began on the 7th of October. Gaza was already facing uh, several uh, crises, mass unemployment, food insecurity for as many as uh, over half the population, uh, more or less uh, shortages, of course, of fuel, medicine, uh, staff, workers, an issue that we've talked about so often uh, on the show with Anna. And we will also proceed to talk about uh, in our next bit. Uh, but before we get there, Anna, you're in Europe at the moment. Um, what is the kind of response? Because we've seen on social media people quite angry with how uh, large sections of Western media are covering uh, these events, uh, not just from the perspective, of course, of fake news that is being disseminated, because now fake news even comes from governments itself. So you really have no uh, boundaries uh, when, it, when it comes to that. But just, just in terms of the narrative that, uh, that is being built and the kind of rhetoric um, and, and processes of, you know, otherizing, treating as subhumans, uh, and how that has kind of allowed the world to sit back and watch uh, as some of these uh, insane situations unfold. I think uh, that's a very important question right now for Europe, um, because we've, we're seeing different things. So, you know, while there is this uh, whole whole uh, public projection of the Western leaders, of the European so-called leaders uh, and representatives uh, flying to Israel and then uh, supporting uh, supporting uh, the, the attacks by the Israeli occupying forces. At the same time, we're seeing also mobilizations by the people uh, in all parts of Europe uh, who are essentially standing up for Palestine. So it's not, um, I think that what's being represented as a, uh, as a European pr uh, perspective is not the perspective of the people of Europe. Um, and of course, uh, it is true that uh, for, for many people, it's been difficult over, over the past two weeks to counter the mainstream narrative that has come from governments and is be being pushed really aggressively 
uh, through all channels that uh, the, and that is that Israel is defending itself and that it has every right to do so. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we are also seeing that people are speaking up and that they are using the public uh, the public spaces that are given to them uh, in order to you know to to try and at least push. Uh, for what is really happening in Gaza, for what is really happening in Palestine. And again, uh, this is not always easy because uh, we know that already uh, France and Germany have imposed bans on pro-Palestinian uh, pro uh, demonstrations. This is not mm -hmm. something that they have done uh, or, or, uh, when it comes to pro-Israeli uh, demonstrations. Uh, and it's essentially very, uh, it, mm, there is a climate of people sometimes being uh, intimidated by what they're seeing around themselves and what, uh, what the governments are pushing uh, as, as, again, the European uh, perspective. Uh, but yeah. on the other hand, it's not uh, so, uh, there have been massive turnouts in, when it comes to protests uh, everywhere in Europe, from Spain to Ireland to Slovenia, to Italy, to the UK. So um, there are mm, massive amounts of people who know what is going on in Gaza and who are supportive mm -hmm. of the people of Palestine. All right. Um, we leave it uh, there for now on Gaza, Anna, but, um, but we'll continue talking to you because um, as you were um, pointing out to us, since the 12th of October, health rallies have been held in various parts of uh, Lombardy in Italy, and tomorrow there's a big central event uh, or that's on October 21st, of course, uh, being tomorrow. Uh, a big central event happening in Milan. Uh, the focus is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, against the growing privatization of healthcare and, uh, yeah, to, to demand uh, the people's right to access uh, healthcare uh, as and when they need and for what they need it uh, and for free. More, most importantly, and, and strengthening health systems to get to that stage, Anna, instead of um, sort of the continuing the process of uh, cutting their legs off, as we've seen uh, over the past couple of decades. Um, and yes, uh, so you know we're going we're talking about a series of protests that um, essentially were announced at the beginning of the month even a bit before if we look at that, that uh, at it but from the beginning of the month there has um, there has been a push in Lombardy uh, to fight against uh, the changes that they have seen all they they have already seen implemented in their health system and that uh, if it were up to the government of Georgia Meloni uh, who is also the government that you know uh, uh, criminalizes people saving uh, migrants in the Mediterranean. Uh, those are the policies that the Maloney government would like to see implemented in the in the rest of uh, Italy as well. And so um, there has been quite a strong mobilization since the beginning of October in Italy. Uh, if we look back also at the national demonstration that was take uh, that took place in Rome, uh, where the trade unions, together with civil society organizations, turn out in you know. Uh, in what was really a huge amount of uh, people who demanded, uh, yes, the respect of the constitution, yes, to um, improved labor rights. But very importantly, they have recognized the public health system as something, as a key rallying point for the future. And this, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, very related to what they have seen happening uh, over the past years uh, in the public health system. Um, of course, in Lombardy, um, it's um, it went up to um, well, uh, quite quite a bit of an extent because uh, they have faced an increased uh, introduction of the private sector in healthcare since the uh, mid 1990s. So uh, it's been a very strong push to equalize the public and the private sector. And so mm. now uh, the health activists, together with the trade unions, again are demanding that this trend is reversed and that uh, uh, there is a return to what was uh, imagined to be uh, a tax-based public health system which cares for everyone for free at the point of uh, receiving care. Um, so so what are the uh, sort of like likely uh, events, the, what is the central event about, uh, as in how many people do we expect to gather there and, and is it uh, 
also a sort of push against, like you were mentioning, uh, not focusing so much on sort of super specialized or only, you know, for example, if cancer care, but also to look at primary health care and, and what and the basic needs of building a healthy society first. Uh, and then get, and like you were pointing out, maybe it connects back to why public health has become a central sort of pillar in this entire uh, political struggle. Uh, absolutely. So uh, it has very much to do with how the health system in Italy was imagined to be and how it's looking right now. And this is something that, you know, if you look at the left parties at Potere al Popolo, what they have been warning for, for well, for essentially years is that there is a focus, uh, like in many other European countries, on talking about healthcare, about uh, this very high tech concept of healthcare. Uh, when what is essentially missing is the very basics of it. So there's a very weakened system of primary healthcare. There's an extreme shortage of health workers all over the place. Uh, as the private sector was allowed in uh, public uh, public hospitals and public uh, public health centers closed down. So uh, this is something that's supposed to be the first line of um, of healthcare for for people, and this is increasingly becoming unaccept uh, inaccessible to uh, to people in Italy. Uh, right now, because of the policies that were implemented, because of the cuts that uh, were imposed on the health uh, budget uh, for years, uh, there are now millions of people on waiting lists. So it's uh, it, it really goes to extremes. Some some health activists in Lombardy actually said that you know there's for some quite elementary health procedures in that region there's a waiting mm -hmm. list for four years that means that millions of people look at the waiting list and they just decide okay if i have money i'll go to the private sector if i don't have money i won't get the procedure so that's uh, you know that should be a sign enough of uh, how wrong things uh, are going on right now now what's worrying is that there is no recognition that this has this has been the wrong trend to take and what we're uh, hearing about is essentially about pursuing the same policies just went up a bit. So, you know, um, there has been a decentralization of healthcare already. And this also relates to what I was saying about the closure of the public hospitals and the community health centers uh, that went hand in hand. And now as the government pursues an even more extreme version of this decentrali uh, decentralization and administrative devolution, uh, it means that it would uh, make matters in health worse, but more generally, it would increase the uh, inequalities that already exist between different Italian uh, regions of Italy. So uh, what people have been warning about that, you know, um, they're already looking at a crumbling health system in the south of Italy. Uh, if the policies that the government is pushing for would come true, it would mean that it's we're talking about two Italys right now. We are talking about North uh, that either has money or has money to uh, uh, to be able to go to uh, to private health uh, healthcare providers, and then we have the South with a completely devastated health system. Uh, while the idea enshrined in the constitution is that healthcare is a right and that it should be provided uh, to everyone through um, as a responsibility of the state. Yeah. All right, Anna. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time today. I think we'll bring this episode of Daily Debrief uh, to a close. We're not done for the week yet, though. We'll be back tomorrow uh, with another update. Uh, we will, of course, be leading uh, with the big story uh, of the times, I think, uh, Gaza, of course. Uh, but in the meantime, we have written reports on all of these uh, subjects on our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, also, give us a follow on social media platforms for updates. Uh, until tomorrow, thank you very much for watching.